Goedenavond, dames en heren. Van harte welkom in de Bali. Wat fijn dat jullie hier allemaal zijn, zeker op zo'n zonnige meiavond als vandaag. Uh, ik wacht even tot de laatste mensen een plekje hebben. Mijn naam is Rex Zevenke, ik ben programmamaker hier bij de Bali en ik uh, mag vandaag de honneurs waarnemen van mijn collega's bij de Bali Cinema. Die hier dagelijks uh, de mooiste documentaires programmeren. En met regelmaat ook speciale bijeenkomsten organiseren, zoals ook vanavond. De spelre spelregels zijn vrij simpel. U gaat zo meteen uh, de documentaire The Cleaners zien. En meteen aansluitend daaraan is er een uh, vraagsprek door nieuwsuurjournalist Ilko Bos van Roosentaal. Met een van de twee regisseurs, Hans Blok. Voertaal daarvoor is Engels. Uh, dat duurt ongeveer een half uurtje met daarna uh, wat ruimte voor vragen van u uit het publiek. Dus mochten er vragen bij u opkomen um, gedurende do de documentaire, onthoud ze, zodat u ze later kunt stellen. Um, op dat moment zal ik rondlopen met deze microfoon, zodat iedereen de vraag ook duidelijk kan horen. Uh, voordat we de documentaire starten, een paar vraagjes van mij uit, omdat ik gewoon wel nieuwsgierig ben. Uh, wie hier gebruikt dagelijks sociale media? De meeste, niet iedereen. Wie hier heeft specifiek een Facebook-account? Dat zijn ongeveer de sociale media gebruikers. Sorry? Niet zo vaak. Uh, wel. Wie heeft er wel eentje? Ja. Um, wie heeft het gevoel dat die afhankelijk is van zijn Facebook-account of van sociale media in general. Twee, drie, vier, vijf. En wie overweegt het om zijn Facebook-account te verwijderen? Vijf. Dat vind ik dan zes. Dat vind ik een relevant getal, omdat ik heel erg benieuwd ben of dat nog hetzelfde getal is na het zien van deze documentaire. Uh, ik wens jullie heel veel uh, plezier, of vooral een goede voorstelling, en ik zie jullie zo meteen terug. Please help me welcome on the stage uh, director Hans Blok en journalist Ilko Bos van Rosenthal. Give them a warm applause, please. Hello. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, let's start right away, Hans. Well, first of all, you have a co-director who yeah, could Moritz. not be here. Moritz, um, he's at another festival in South Korea. Exactly, yeah. We have to split up because there are so many festivals at the moment, so that's why he cannot be here at the moment. And how exciting is it because the release is going to be in a week? It's very exciting. I mean, um, um, we had the world premiere at the Sundance Film Festival and um, then until now we had so many festivals around the world presenting the film and now it's being the next step to have a release in, in cinema um, in the Netherlands and in Germany and in many more countries. It's, it's I think, very important to, to bring awareness uh, about the issues in the film and so we are very happy that uh, many people can see the movie. Let's talk about the film. Uh, we'll talk for about half an hour and then we'll have plenty of time for uh, questions from the audience as well. Um, I, I, I want to start with the making of of this movie because that's interesting for every movie, I guess, but for this one in particular. Um, and then we'll get to the content and, and the ethics of um, what we see in the film. Um, it was supposed to be a play. Uh, it was a play, actually. But then you also decided to make it into a movie. Why focus on this particular topic, the moderation of content on social media? I mean, there, there was a specific case in, in 2013 when uh, it was kind of the starting point of the project because there was a case when a child abuse video uh, went online on Facebook um, in the States and it was not taken down um, and we asked ourselves is there someone who's curating what we see is there someone who's filtering um, the social media sites because we all know that material like this is existing in the web but not very often on social media sites 
So we started asking ourselves, how is that possible? And first we thought it's just an algorithm or a machine and uh, an automatic process who's filtering that kind of material. But one, then, then we started to get in contact with the researcher, Sarah T. Roberts, which is also in the movie at the beginning. And she told us that actually humans are doing that job and that there is a very huge, gigantic shadow industry in the Philippines where thousands of young Filipino, uh, Filipinos every day have to review on a screen what we are not supposed to see and no one knows about them. So that was kind of the, the trigger point when we, had, we are curious about that and we like to get in contact with these workers. And I can imagine that you uh, try to reach the, the tech giants to, to talk about this or to um, uh, whether this was true or they could bring you in contact and, and pretty soon you found out that they were very secretive about this. Yeah, exactly. It's an incredibly secretive uh, industry. Um, we tried from the beginning on to get in contact also with these big executives and CEOs from all the big companies like Google, Twitter, Facebook. And there was, uh, until now, no response at all. Uh, we also sent the final movie to all the companies and there was also no response at all. And I think this is one of the main characteristics, unfortunately, of these big uh, new tech companies that they are not feeling the need to talk about what's going on behind doors and they are not interesting to, interested to have a public discussion about, for example, the influence uh, on social media, on, on society. You could argue um, that for the tech companies, um, they, they could show off by showing that they take the moderating of content uh, seriously, um, besides that the film shows that they do it you know, for low wages people in the Philippines. But I mean, moderation of content in itself is, is not bad publicity for the tech companies. Um, yes, but um, I mean, it's not about, uh, uh, um, it's, it's about how they handle that kind of work. And, and that's kind of shocking, I think, because it's such an important job to decide what we are supposed to see in the digital sphere because also Facebook becoming more and more like the major infrastructure of communication and information. And um, usually if you have, for example, a newspaper, you have very well educated people deciding on what is published and what is not. And they are just trained three to five days doing that kind of work. Uh, and um, as you can saw in our movie, um, there are so many mistakes because they have not the right cultural background on deciding what should be published and what should be not. And there are so many gray areas where uh, all the workers have to decide out of a gut feeling. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons why Facebook uh, tried to keep, keep the work very secretive because, I mean, it's the business model of these companies is to gain as much money as possible. And imagine have like 20,000 or 30,000 uh, content moderators based in Europe or based in the States that uh, would cost much, much more money for the companies. So they decide to outsource the work to the Philippines and the workers there just paid one dollar uh, per hour to doing that job. And it's is, is that the only reason the low wage is why they picked the Philippines? You said earlier that there's some moderation in Europe and, and Berlin, for instance, as well, but it's mostly the Philippines, as we see in the film. Are low wages the only reason or is there another reason? Yeah, there are several other reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons which is very interesting, um, when we started researching in the Philippines, um, some of the outsourcing companies offer the service for Facebook. Facebook. They promote uh, that the Philippines is the perfect spot to do that work because of the history of the country. Because uh, 300 years the Spanish people occupied the country, then 100 years the Americans came there and occupied the country. And then the companies saying that all the Filipino people sharing our Western values, our uh, Western perspective, so they are capable of deciding what we are not supposed to see, for example, which we experience very differently. Um, and there's another reason, and I think it's not coincidence that they outsource the work there, is that the Philippines is a very Catholic country. 90% of the Filipino people are strong believers in Christian religion. Um, and uh, when you, for example, go in a school in the Philippines, you can read the quote, cleanliness is next to godliness. So whenever it's clean, you come closer to God. And this is kind of the mindset, the background, the cultural 
uh, on deciding uh, uh, about every case. Um, and there's also another reason I would say it's it's Duterte, which is now the president of the Philippines. And he also has, has a, a similar mindset because when he started the campaign for, for the election two years ago, he always said, I will clean up. I will clean up society. And what he meant with that is that he is trying to get rid of all the criminals, all the drug addicts, all the drug users, uh, and um, actually kills them. He kills thousands of people in the Philippines until he's running for the president. And this is kind of uh, the ways they, they, as you can, as you saw already in the movie, some of the moderators told us, uh, I'm doing the same like Duterte. I try to uh, uh, make it clean, make uh, try to make a healthy environment, whatever that is. Uh, and that's in a way very scary, I think. Just just as a as a side little sidestep, um, you're saying 94. 95% of the country, and so the moderators as well, are very devoted Catholics. <clears throat> While making the film, did you notice how that influenced their selection process in a sense that perhaps Islam-related topics would be uh, deleted easier than, than other topics? Yeah, interesting question, because uh, that was uh, what we experienced uh, there, that there's a really strong uh, Islam Islamophobic behavior there. Um, we decided not to include that into the movie, but there were several cases where they decide to delete content which is related to, to for example, the Islam or a different religion. Non-violent content. Other non content violent, that should have stayed on. Yeah, non-violent content, uh, which is also a very interesting topic for another movie uh, related to to that uh, thing. And I, and I don't know if you know about the political situation in in the Philippines, but uh, if you are not Christian, it's really hard to to believe, for example, in the Islam on the Philippines because uh, it's a it's a minority, and they try to get rid of uh, that as well. Why did you not include it in the film? Because you, when when you work on on that topic, you need like several sources and evidence to put something in the movie uh, that is really profound. And and we had the feeling mm, mm, that it's we didn't know if it's just an individual statement from some of the moderators or if it's a, a general trend. a general trend uh, on content moderators on the philippines so we are a bit careful using that because it it's it's a major uh, yeah. yeah you want you want to be very secure yeah, yeah. and very yeah, yeah. certain i understand i guess the, the the question i had and i'm pretty sure everybody in the audience had if if the tech companies didn't want you to talk to these people if these people are employed through you know uh, they're outsourced through other uh, uh, companies they don't work with their own names how the hell did you find them <laughs> yeah and how long did that take yeah it takes very long uh, it took very long um yeah that was the most challenging part of the research to to get in contact with these workers um because it's really it's a really really secretive industry um, and that means that for example they're using code works to 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 protect that the public knows about the work when we first traveled to manila um, um, we didn't found out what kind of outsourcing company is working uh, for facebook because they for example using very interesting terms like com community operations analyst or data analyst or stuff like that which is sounds interesting but it's not the dirtiest job of the internet sounds boring too sounds boring yeah uh, and and then uh, we were like detectives uh, collecting small snippets of information to come closer to the industry and one of the milestones uh, uh, we reached was that we found out all the facebook employees the ones who are working for facebook they have to use a code word and the code word is honey badger honey badger project which is a small little tiny animal living in the desert you mean all the cleaners in in manila yeah working for facebook have to use these kind of code words uh, um, to make sure that this work is really kept secret um, or for example the 
the companies hiring private polices to to scan the profiles of the workers and make sure that they aren't talking to anyone. Uh, there was one case when um, we built also a, a network of locals helping us to, to research in Manila. And there was a moment when um, um, one of the company members took photos of all of our team and they sent it through the whole company uh, with a warning, uh, when you talk to these guys, you will immediately lose your job. So it's it's an atmosphere of pressure. They are really um, They are really feeling afraid of disclosing anything. And, and uh, what we did, uh, we did the opposite. We don't put pressure on the workers. Uh, when we first met them, we really built a relationship of trust with them. We didn't talk about the work. We didn't talk about uh, uh, what they are doing. We didn't have a camera and film. But, but before, sorry to interrupt, but before even meeting them, you have to know how to reach them. You have to have some names. And I suppose you need a intermediate or a, or a whistleblower of some kind or not? No, I, I mean, for example, when we found out that they're using Honey Badger, it's, it's very easy because you can speak with someone, ah, okay, you're working for a Honey Badger project, interesting, and no question. So we know, we knew they're working for Facebook, but we don't talk about that. And after a while, meeting again, meeting again, uh, like small talk, I mean, it's like uh, build a relationship, a friendship again with them. And after a while, we started talking about the work when they feel safe, when they trusted us. And, and, and that was the way. It's really a, a long process. It took us more than a year to, to, to get in contact with Before these people. Before you would even turn the camera on, because that's, that's the next step and another threshold for them to speak on camera. Exactly. They could lose their jobs. Yeah. Uh, but there's one thing we didn't expect when we when we talked to them and we talked with them about the work is that they are in a way really really proud of what they are doing every day and they really like to share that the work they do every day is like one of the most important work of the digital age because uh, some of the protagonists said to us imagine uh, we are not working just for one hour the internet would look like a mess uh, you won't go there anymore um, so um, they are really it's so beautiful now the internet it's, a, it's beautiful it's paradise <laughs> <laughs> so they really think um, yeah I mean they do a very very tough job and a very important job no no matter what um, but when they started talking uh, uh, without us about the work they also starting to reflect what they are doing and they open their emotions and so on and so on and then some of them started to 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 quit their jobs, to left their jobs. And that was this, the, the turning point where we saw a chance to, to have them in our movie. Because everyone you can see right now in the movie has left the job uh, before we started shooting or while we shoot. So Be that Because of the emotional toll or? Because of the non-disclosure agreement they have to sign for the companies. So they are not allowed by contract to talking about oh, the I work. I understand, but I mean, why did they leave the job? Was that because they couldn't handle it anymore or because they found something else or? Because uh, there are many reasons for that. They can't handle it anymore or um, they, they reflect what they are doing while talking with us about the work or they found another job. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's it, as you can see it in the movie, um, if you work like eight to ten hours seeing all that material all day long in front of your eyes on a screen, sure, it has a very strong effect on your mental health and, and it's, it's very tough to handle that job. Uh, yeah, I can imagine do that job, for example. A, a decent employer, wh whether or not it goes through outsourcing, but, but would take care of people uh, in, in, in a counseling way. I mean, do they get any uh, mental help? Because if you watch thousands of pictures and uh, decapitation videos every day and, and child pornography, everybody has seen the film. Do they get any help? No, not really. Unfortunately, not. I mean, some of the companies, just a few, offer something like uh, psychological support, which means uh, that they have quarterly a group session with like 30 people in a room, and then someone is asking, okay, uh, has someone a problem in the room with the work? Huh? And then everybody is afraid talking about their emotions because they have... A room like this. A room like this. Stands and, up uh, and I put a microphone on someone. Do you have a problem? <laughs> you, you can ask them anything. Yeah, 
you won't say anything because they're afraid of losing their jobs when they talk about their problems. So this is this is not a psychological support, and many of the companies have nothing, so they're left alone. It's uh, what's very strong in the film, um, visually also, <clears throat> and it, it's your first film, which is hard to believe. Um, uh, th but it's true. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, th th these guys are on the 20th or 30th floor, and and they they look over Manila and. Even though they're young, many of them, but but you know, I I, I I can understand they feel powerful. They're they're on top of the city, and they like you said, they feel very proud, guarding the internet um, in in a way. Was was that important for you to get that, the physics of it in 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 the film as well, the, the location? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, when we first traveled to Manila, we. Uh, knew from the first second on that this is the perfect spot to shoot a movie because it's so cinematic. I mean, the city is, is full of smog. There are bridges all over the city. You can't see the sunlight anymore. It's It feels so dark and there are 80 million people. Uh, it's, it's so crowded and so on and so on. And um, we knew it would be perfect to, to shoot a movie there. But then we had... Uh, we're facing a lot of problems uh, while thinking about uh, shooting a movie because how do you do, how do you make a film uh, about an industry which is really completely secretive? I mean, we we had no access to these office spaces because we are not allowed to go inside. And how do you shoot, how do you make a film about people who, are, who have to be anonymous because they are not allowed to talk with us? So we are facing problems and we have to find solutions for that. And one of the uh, luckiest moments uh, in our research preparing the shooting was that we found an unused office page which really looks like this. We uh, did nothing in, in that. So all the cubicles were there, all the monitors, all the computers, um, uh, but it was unused and we had the possibility to shoot there. And that was kind of the, the the point where we knew, okay, now we can make a film about that because it's like the 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 core the core place where we where we shoot and and as you said that before it's 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 so interesting to see someone working at night 24 hours in the 20 seconds floor uh, with a view around the city and you already saw where these people are living outside of manila in a very tiny wooden house with with a family and they're almost very poor and it it's such a, a, a feeling of, of of pride to go there into the city to work in the center of a city in a nice clean office space with air condition with with a view over the city to have such a powerful job and that was one of the goals try to capture that kind of feeling in the movie did they um obviously it's tough to deal with the the violence or the you know the the pornography and anything the the abuse that they watch every day but did they think um do the cleaners think about the, the eth ethical questions you thought about about you know the internet or social media becoming a frankenstein monster becoming too big or, or was it pretty simple for them uh, it was ethically? pretty simple yeah there was um, none of the workers, uh, mine, mean except one of the persons you can saw in the movie, which was the girl walking on the beach at the end of the film, saying, "Okay, what are we doing right now? Uh, we have to think about slaving ourselves every day." That was the only person who had like more uh, overview of what she what she did there. But for the other content moderator, it's very simple. It's it's a job. You, you, you're not reflecting, uh, for example, uh, what social media has, has for effect on the world. And um, also, I mean, they're overwhelmed. They're 18, 19 years old workers. Uh, th this is the first job for most of uh, these content moderators doing a job. And, and they are also very isolated uh, in the Philippines. Um, they're not reflecting so much about um, the impact they have, the power they have to decide. You did speak to former tech tech um, executives. Um, the, the the lady I, now I forgot her name, but the lady Nicole who's, Wong. Nicole Nicole Wong, who who is in the film. How um, I suppose you haven't spoken to her after. We did. Oh, you did. We how, did. How did she? She she was at the screening in San Francisco. Really? Yeah. What did she <laughs> What did she think of the film? Because, uh, you know, 
I wouldn't be completely happy. Yeah, that's what we thought, uh, and we were a bit afraid when she she uh, attended to the screening. <laughs> Uninvited. <laughs> Uninvited. Uh, but after the movie, she was kind of okay with that, and and she also uh, informed other former workers to see that kind of movie. Um, that was interesting, and that was also what is really interesting for for most of the employees we had also the screening in san francisco it was uh, one day after the testimony of, of zuckerberg and there were a few facebook employees in the audience and just to let you know we tried to reach facebook from the very beginning on and try to involve them in a project and and we had so many questions and there was no response at all uh, we also sent the final movie to all these companies and there was no public statement there was no answer no response but some of the employees of Facebook saw the movie in San Francisco and they were shocked because they didn't know what's going on. Um, and um, they were really like, like uh, they were passionate and, and talking to us, we have to show the film at the Facebook headquarter. We have to organize something because I, I, I won't work uh, 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 again on Facebook when we don't talk about those topics. And, and, uh, Maybe there there is a movement of, of former workers or a movement of workers in the in the Silicon Valley. They they rethink what they are building. So so I guess you have no idea yet of such a screening will will take place. But you're you're hopeful in a way. Yeah, hopeful. Yeah. We, I mean the, the 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 film is very timely. Obviously, I mean you you couldn't have timed it better. Um, the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, uh, Zuckerberg at, in Congress, like you said, uh, testifying about this. Um, <clears throat> do you feel that there's... Was, that was planned. That was planned. That was <laughs> right, kind exactly. of the promotion. Uh... Exactly. <laughs> you're, you're a wizard. Yes. Um, do you feel there's... An, I mean, what you just described about the Facebook employees play, uh, being at the screening and, and talking to you, that's, that sounds hopeful in a sense, but... Um, in, in uh, the executives of the company, do you believe that there's an actually an actual change in, in conscience in some way, or are they just forced to reflect on this because of you know Cambridge Analytica and that kind of stuff? I mean, how optimistic are you that there's an actual mindset changing? Not really, to be honest, because when you, I don't know if you watched the, the Congress hearing with Zuckerberg three weeks ago, I mean, the sentence which I heard uh, the most was, I will follow up with my team on that. So no solution at all, just just to try to avoid to, to solve problems. And I think that's kind of the, the mindset there. And Well, no, I'm just saying that after such a dark film and a... And a very somber Q and A. You cannot leave us without some sense of optimism or light. Or you don't see any um, any changes. I mean, I think. Or does it need to start grassroots from from the employees employees you mentioned? Um, it has to start on every level. Also, we as the user have to to start rethinking what we are using every day, and it's also up to us how we accept that i mean facebook uh, and that's what we try to acknowledge with the film facebook becomes more or less like the public the public the digital public sphere so uh, so many parts of our social life has been transferred to these uh, digital platforms and um, they have such a powerful influence on on what's going on in society there are open debates and so on and so far um, and we have to acknowledge that these platforms are not any longer just a tool to share cute cat videos or holiday pictures. So it's part of our democracy. And, and they are just a few people of private companies having the whole power of creating those tools. And we don't know anything about that because everything is decided behind closed doors. And we, we won't accept that in the analog sphere. I mean, imagine someone like, uh, like someone who is running a, a shopping mall becomes like the leader of a state. We won't accept that. Uh, but this well. is happening. <laughs> I don't know if you have other experience here no, in no, the no, Netherlands. No, not but <laughs> here, not here, no, but anyway, go on. Yeah, uh, so also we have to put pressure as the user to these companies and, 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 and stop being accepting that uh, um, all this is going on, yeah.
Um, before we go to audience questions, and, and I have several more, but maybe we should go to the audience. Be but one more thing, uh, content needs to be moderated. I guess we agree, that's good. Yeah. Um, um, do you have an alternative? I mean, this obviously is not the solution, but somebody needs to do it. Yeah, sure. It's not about the question, do we need content moderation? Sure, we need content moderation in, in a way, but uh, um, as I said before, this is such an important job and uh, Facebook has to hire uh, really, really qualified workers doing that kind of job. Also, we need diverse teams of content moderators. I mean, the main spot of content moderation is now the Philippines. It's a very specific perspective on, on the world. Uh, and this is also what we have to change. And when you think about a newspaper, for example, they are also uh, uh, content editors, uh, and and they are very well educated. They are journalists. They 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 know about ethics and so on and so far. Uh, and Facebook have to stop um, try to spending or they have to spend more money on, on uh, such an important job and have to hire really expert and specialists all around the world to doing that kind of job. But, but would a solution be if you, you spread it more geographically, not, you know, religiously? Uh, yeah, sure. Everything, would that be the beginning of a solution? That I mean, would be the beginning, but this is just one point. I mean, um, there are much more questions, for example, now just, uh, just imagine Facebook is, is one of the biggest states in the world, you can say, because there are two million people using that kind of tool. Billion uh, people using that kind of tool. It's in a way like the biggest state in the world. And we don't know about, for example, the constitution uh, of this state. Uh, this, is, this is really unbelievable. You don't know what to do there. You don't know what you're allowed to say there. And whenever Facebook is deleting something, you just uh, uh, get a very sh one sentence email, your post was deleted by Facebook. That's it. No explanation. No, not, I don't know the reason why, for example. There's no discussion about um, um, what are the rules in the digital world and we have to start thinking about that and we have to, for example uh, to have like something like the digital united nations uh, um, where everyone who's using that kind of platform sitting on one table and discussing about what are the guidelines what are the guidelines we're accepting uh, worldwide and uh, there's no discussion at all about uh, very important topics are there any um Questions from the audience, smarter questions than the ones I just asked. In the back. Hi. Uh, you were seeing the, uh, the moderators using some kind of review software. Uh, is that real? And if so, uh, how were you able to shoot that? What kind of software? Is a kind of review software on the screen? So um we rebuilt the original software um and the original software looks really like this just a delete there are two options to decide this is ignore and delete and if you delete a content you have 10 more options uh, and you have to say why you delete a content for example because of self-harm because of suicide content because of terroristic content because of child abuse content but that's the actual software they're using you rebuild it. Good question, by the way. But but you rebuild it because uh, obviously you couldn't get a hold of the original. But they told you yeah. how it what it looked like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, very interesting. Hi. Well, first, thank you for the great documentary. Um, thank you. Well, I want to you know continue on what you were talking before you open up the question is i think it's also important to think about the business model of of facebook in when we talk about this for example to educate and to guide and and um, counsel the content moderators it costs money but on the other hand for the users facebook is free so and if you buy a newspaper we have to pay money to you know to get quality information or if you want to send messages you know the old way by post, we have to pay for the stamp. So, um, and then we don't even talk about the advertisements and the push notifications. So I think 
well, maybe for next documentary, it's you know very interesting to think also about the money side of Facebook. Is, is it? Uh, I mean, besides um, the fact that this is going to be your next documentary now, um, but, but <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> or maybe I'll steal it. But um, the, the business model of Facebook. I mean, obviously, extreme content is brings them profit, right? Yeah, I mean, hopefully we had like a, a small scene about exactly that topic because it's it's uh, it's by design that, for example, Facebook is producing or supporting content which is extreme because what they found out that is uh, the more extreme you post something on Facebook, the more attention you seek. So these platforms are in a way attention seekers. And if you post something which is extreme, it will have likes, it will have shares, it will have uh, um, yeah, all the views. And, and this traffic can be converted into advertisement and into money. So they're making profit about spreading fake news, uh, spreading hatred. And this can lead to a, a very shattering genocide, for example, in Myanmar. And they're doing nothing because this is the business model of this company. And when the only gain, the only goal is to gain money, um, this is very problematic because they don't feel responsibility on, for example, education or, or to to support more understanding or to support more complex content on these platforms. And they can do so; it's it's possible. They can rebuild or redesign those platforms, but they are not doing it. Oh yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, firstly, sensational documentary. I wish you all the success with that. I hope everyone sees it. I thought it was brilliant. Um, one of the things that really got me was the point when you were talking to uh, the artist, the lady who drew the slightly uh, sort of uh, rude picture of Trump and uh, the gentleman who was cutting out the photos. Um, one of the things that I, I worry about personally is that the ability of these people who challenge the status quo and challenge these truths are losing the abilities to go through other mediums. You know, if you accept that there will always be a version of the truth that Facebook wants to push or any of these other social media campaigns, uh, companies, did you ever get the feeling that they were losing the ability to go through other mediums? Did you worry that maybe they had the ability to step back and say, OK, we can't get our message out through this. How else can we? Did you feel like they were losing the tools to do that? I, I didn't quite get the question myself. Maybe you did, but but uh, who lost that capability? I'm, not... I'm just talking a bit about people here who have uh, who have differing messages to the status quo, who want to challenge the truths that put out. Mm -hmm. Facebook and social media is the way you get these messages out, and right. obviously they're being blocked. Right. Do they have the tools to go through other mediums? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my fear. Is that you know? Yeah. Um... You're absolutely right. That's the problem uh, with Facebook nowadays because Facebook is becoming bigger and bigger. It's not any longer just an option where you can use, um, uh, maybe I have a Facebook account or maybe not because it's so important to have the, the public sphere or the, 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 the digital public with a lot of people to, for example, uh, promote your artwork or to talk about like uh, politics, for example. And, and Facebook is doing everything they can to 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 grow the platforms and make it much bigger to to offer like a tv station to offer a market to offer like a dating app so you don't have to leave facebook anymore and for example myanmar is a very good example facebook becomes the internet itself it's the only place where you go online because they bring the internet to the the developing world and they have free access to using Facebook and they don't use mail, they don't use messenger services, they don't use other media outlets, they're just using Facebook. And this is very problematic, uh, as you can saw in our film, that if an artist is being censored, the artist has no other way to promote their work or to, to spread uh, their opinions online. And this is, uh, is, this is a very uh, d uh, um, dangerous status quo. A uh, more technical question. I was wondering uh, how the content gets filtered to, in the first place, like uh, arrive like in front of the eyes of those moderator in the Philippines. Like, what's the sh channel? So there are two different channels how content uh, is sent to the Philippines. The first one is a pre-filter. That's an algorithm 
So whenever uh, uh, the machine is analyzing, for example, the shape of a sexual organ or blood or a breast, then the pre-filter um, is sending those kinds of stuff to the Philippines. And the Filipino workers have to double check if the machine is right or not. And the second way is when we, uh, as the user, flag something, like report uh, content which we are thinking it's not appropriate to show, it's also being sent to the Philippines. So this is how it works. Eric, how much more time do we have? A few more questions? Yeah, maybe two, three Maybe two. Two, if there are two or three yep. really quick ones. Front row here. Run one really long one. <laughs> so, um, which other companies did you learn of that used the services in the Philippines, if any? And did you also learn of companies who are explicitly avoiding this sort of practice and perhaps have more of a sustainable way, like maybe even a fair trade sort of uh, label or idea about it? So, all of the big social media companies, Twitter, Google, Google which is YouTube, Facebook, Facebook which is also Instagram, using the outsourcing service in Manila. Um, and we, we didn't disclose that in the movie because that was one of uh, uh, the, the, the reasons to protect our protagonists, not to disclose the fact where they're working for, because otherwise it would be much more harder for us to take care of them. But all the big social media companies working there or, or doing the service there. And this is a very good question. If there's another company is doing that in a more sustainable way, I don't know any. Because that's the problem. If, 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 if the internet is, is divided uh, just within a few platforms, I mean, we have like four or five big major uh, internet companies. The amount of content which is uploaded every day is enormous. Just imagine Facebook, every minute 450,000 450, posts are made every minute. So they have to deal with a huge amount of content and that's why they have to, in a way, outsource the, the service to the F Filipino people because they are very cheap. We have time for one final brilliant question. <laughs> Pressure. Or less brilliant? <laughs> or a really dumb question? No? I think you were, you and the film, you together were um, complete. No more questions. <laughs> so I want to thank you for coming and good luck with the um, screening next week and good luck with the film. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching.